newcomers, and we have some newcomers. Uh, I have some announcements to make before I bring our speaker up. Uh, first of all, I said this to some of you, but the, the next event we have is the uh, Shenley Park walking tour on the 2nd of June. It was going to be the 9th. We had to change it to the uh, 2nd because our, our guide had to be out of town. Uh, Susan Rodemaker, who did a marvelous tour for Frick Park for us last year, is going to do it. It's at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll meet at the uh, Visitor Center at uh, uh, the Shenley Park Visitor Center, which is right across the street from at Phipps. It's a little one-story building. You can't miss it. And uh, we start at 10. She may be showing some slides of old Shenley Park before we start walking. And it lasts till about 12.15. The second thing I need to talk to you about is uh, Freddie Fu, most people know his name, will be coming next week, month to speak about his, his route to Pittsburgh, his own history, the history of the Pittsburgh Sports Medicine, UPMC Sports Medicine Clinic, and the whole field of sports medicine, which he's been an important part of. Now that meeting is on the 5th of June. Uh, I think I got the date right. It's the first. It's the first Tuesday, because of Dr. Fu's schedule, and also we're going to be meeting in the sanctuary rather than here because of a conflict. But uh, I think probably a good idea in terms of crowd. Uh, after that, Terry Nietzsche, who is the, the, was the founder of this group before me, is coming back in July to say hello and talk about some of the things he's doing in historic preservation. Then we'll have August off. And in September, we're going to hear about the Calvary Cemetery, Hazelwood. I think it's in Hazelwood. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and, and the rest of the schedule you can get in the back. The last thing I want to tell you is, yours truly was interviewed last week by Channel 4, uh, a little thing on the history of Squirrel Hill, and uh, I'm waiting to hear from them to confirm a couple of things, but it should be on next week, and we'll get it into the... Uh, uh, website if, if they give us an exact date. It won't be very long, but they're also talking about taking pictures from our book and putting it on a website and taking follow-up pictures new, sort of a then and now. So they're doing this from a number of different communities. Mike Clark, the reporter, was the one who interviewed me. So we, you can check the website on that one. Anyone have any questions about these speakers? Okay. Our speaker tonight is Dan Bain. Dan is now a resident of Squirrel Hill. Uh, he arrived in Squirrel Hill in 2007 from the National Geological Survey, and he's now a professor of the, in the Department of Geology and Planetary Science. Dan who grew up in Athens, Ohio, another college kid like so many of us, and uh, then uh, went to Johns Hopkins uh, and various other places along the way, uh, and then went out to Menlo Park, California, and now is here and joins with all of us in, in loving this neighborhood. And Dan is obviously going to talk to us about the history of and the politics of Marcellus Shale. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for all you guys see this. Uh -huh. I need to probably put it close from my mouth. Yeah. You still have trouble here? Okay. Alright. Um, I hope I, did, I pitched this right. I'm going to spend a lot more time on the geology than the, the politics because the politics you know, can get messy. Um, and I mean, I thought maybe that's a better place to start, to think about where this comes from and the implications. I have a little bit at the end, and I try to leave quite a bit of time for questions, so if you guys have specific questions, you should feel free to ask me about those, but I'm going to be spending more time on where the Marcellus comes from. And where the Marcellus comes from is a much funner topic in some ways, because this is an artist's rendition of what things look like in the Devonian, which was <clears throat> hundreds of millions of years ago. That was the time wherein the um, Marcellus Shale was deposited. So 
the thing about the Devonian, which I'll cover in some more detail, is that <clears throat> plants, terrestrial animals, started to emerge. And so you had this, this tremendous change in production, which shows up in, in the um, geologic record a number of different ways, one of those being the carbon-rich sediments that are now yielding the Marcellus Shale. So this is a, a mural from um, the University of Wisconsin's Department of Geology, and it just shows what people thought it might have looked like back when <coughs> the Marcellus Shale was being laid down. And so the first place I want to take you to think about Marcellus Shale is the um, Black Sea. So the kind of area that the Marcellus Shale was deposited in was not unlike what we see today. This is a picture of the coastal Black Sea, um, and in some ways it's probably not that different from what we might have seen when, if we were there back in the Devonian. So the vegetation is scattered, maybe a little bit arid, we, there probably weren't sailboats at that point, but I mean that's the kind of environment that you you're getting. It's not necessarily the terrestrial environment that's important. It's the configuration of the the ocean and the way it's set. And no, first, I forgot. I'm going to go through what I want to talk about today. So you know, the height of the deposition of the Devonian was at about 387 million years ago. That was when it was really getting put down. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about what was going on then, sort of what has happened since, because what has happened since is very important to the amount of gas that you're getting out of the, the Marcellus Shale and the, the patterns of um, how things are drilled, and just spend time talking about how those facts have implications for some of the politics that we're, we're reading about every day in the paper or every week in the paper. And so that's where I'm going. So let's go back to an aerial view of the Black Sea. So this is the Black Sea in about 2008. And you'll notice this is a really nice image. You can see of these big plumes of algal growth coming off of some of the, you know, particularly the western part of the sea. And the reason the Black Sea is special is because you, know, you have rivers bringing in lots of materials. Some of those materials being the energy that, we've, that life finds, is able to use to harvest energy. I mean, the materials that life uses to harvest energy from the sun and create biomass or, or living material. And so you get a lot of stuff coming in the rivers. But the thing about the Black Sea, and those that supports the aquatic life, but the thing about the Black Sea is because of the geometry of the basin and the outlets, there isn't much connection with the rest of the, the um, saline water that covers the earth surface of the earth. Um, so what you tend to start getting there, particularly since it's a deep basin, is you start to build up this living material. This living material stays there. It's at the bottom. It doesn't go away. And if you would bury it, cook it, you might get natural gas hundreds of millions of years from now. <coughs> and so if we go back and look at a, again, this is a, um, a reconstruction of what people think the continental mass might have looked like 387 million years ago in the, in the middle of the Devonian. Um, I think a couple things we need to point out. Here's the equator. So this, this land mass is sitting about at the center of where the sun is going to be hitting us, hitting the Earth's surface. And for those of you wondering what this, where you are, Right about here is Pennsylvania. So you see a lot of these Devoni, I mean these Marcellus Shale maps. They have this arc that goes up into New York, goes down through eastern Ohio, West Virginia, sort of peters, peters out. But because this is a uh, um, rendition, this is not necessarily what things looked exactly like. But you'll notice, and if you can envision the Black Sea, that it points that basin can be is relatively isolated from the rest of the um, the, uh, the larger ocean that's covering the Earth's surface at this point in time. So you're getting some isolation. You're getting an, an area where you can build up this this um, microbial and other type of living material and preserve it over the long term. So 
just thinking about it in a cross section of you. So if we take that 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 ocean, this little area right here that we're just talking about, right about covering most of Pennsylvania, we take a cut, or a slice right through it, and look at it from the side, it might look something more like this. And so you have these whatever iteration of the Appalachian Mountains over here. And you've got rivers coming in, and you've got a relatively deep basin. So just to, to drive this home, you bring in the terrestrial stuff. And what's really important for these gas-making types of rocks is you want to have microbial activity. You know, it's not the big old um, sharks or fish or whatever that lived in the sea that fell out and hit the bottom and were preserved. It's these, these, these tiny, tiny microorganisms that you saw in that aerial photograph, I mean that satellite imagery of the Black Sea that actually end up being deposited on the bottom. And so you're, you're bringing in sediments at the same time. So you have sediments and this microbial living material that's combined on the bottom. And what happens is it's, it's far enough away from the, the um, oxygen that you have in the atmosphere that, it, that, it's, that it is um, isolated and you don't get oxygen. If you don't get oxygen, you have what's called reducing conditions. So those of you who might be familiar with the Gulf of Mexico or Chesapeake Bay, most summer these days, because of the way in which we're <coughs> adding materials to those bays, they go what's called anoxic. And that means that there's no oxygen on the bottom. So then think, or you know, living organisms that utilize the bottom can't live in these areas at some points. The dark sea, I mean, the, Black Sea is almost permanently anoxic, and people think that the Marcellus, the, the ocean that became the Marcellus Shale, was likely very, very similar. It, was, it did not have oxygen getting to the bottom, so that material stayed there. But the thing about the Devonian, the period where the Marcellus Shale was being deposited, is you were seeing this tremendous change in the way, in the sort of a group of organisms that lived in the water and eventually in the terrestrial, in the, the land mass. So the first thing, just at the beginning of the, the Devonian, you have these fish. And these fish were the first, um, some of the first fish, they didn't have jaws. They're their great, 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 their, their descendants are the lampreys. So things that don't have jaws. They also had protection. They had these bony plates all around them. And Somewhere later in the Devonian, these jawless fish turned into jawed fish. Again, you still have these bony plates, You've got a lot of protection. And, you know, each time you add these types of things that eat lots of stuff in um, <coughs> a lake system, you tend to create what's called a trophic cascade. So you eat more stuff, you allow more of these microorganisms to bloom because they're not sort of running out of the stuff they use. So you get these amplifications of the amount of um, living biomaterial that's in these, these areas. And that's all coming out in what's going to eventually become our Marcellus Shale. So if you have a farm pond, lots of times if you add a couple of um, large predatory fish, like a, uh, like a couple of bass or something like that, you can get actually more production out of that farm pond than you do if you just had minnows in it, because you get what's called this trophic cascade. And but even these larger predators start to crowd each other out. So these are called the ostroderms, placoderms. At the very end, you have the tetrapods, which were the first sort of fishes that were able to walk on land. They had low fins. They were able to drag themselves along land. They were developing these lungs in addition to their gills so they could survive for extended periods. And these are the things that became the amphibians. These are the things that became the reptiles that in subsequent geologic time became the dinosaurs and the birds, everything that we see around us today that on the terrestrial system. So you had these dramatic changes in the ocean and you had actually so much <coughs> production and so many different new things growing in the ocean, it got crowded enough that you actually started having vertebrates well, the, the insects had made it to land a while ago. This was the first time that vertebrates really started to get into <coughs> living in the land. And the question is, why would you have land 
animals emerging. And again, I want to point out the, the fact that this is this is an artist's rendition. It's not necessarily true, and in particular, it's been shaded in such a way that you look at it, so you look at it like a modern terrain map. And so you've got these, these green shadings up here on the windward side of mountains that are picking up the, the, um, the, the water that squeezes out of the rain cloud as it moves over the mountain. So you, in our view, if we we're in our expectation, we're going to have a lot of vegetation growing there. But really, the Devonian, not only did you have land animals emerging, you also had <clears throat> the first proto-plants emerging. So this is, again, another artist's rendition. This one's a little bit spacey. I think this is from the New Mexico um, Museum of Natural History. But what you had was little things that, you know, maybe the, the horsehair ferns, or the horsetails that you see today, those, again, are their, their low, uh, descendants far, far removed. But, these were the things that were starting to grow. So these things were moving out of the ocean, starting to creep across the land. You had those, you had the, <clears throat> I can't remember the name of these, because I'm not a hydrologist, and I'm not really a paleobotanist. But what the point is, is that you were getting, the, the land surface really did not have much material living on it, but it had all of that sun beating down on it. And that sun is energy. And so anything that was able to figure out a way to creep out of that ocean and onto the land was able to do very well. And so well in this period of about 100 years, you were getting to mm -hmm. things that were like forest. It had these huge ferns, ferns that were tall up as trees all over the place. So again, this isn't just another artist's redemption. This is sort of the late Devonian. So just to recap of that closed basin, or, you know, sorry, the, um, the, the reason land animals emerge is because there's a lot of food on land that you could get out and eat. And that's why, that's what was going on in the Devonian in terms of the, the biology. So, if you take a look at this, <coughs> this, this conceptual model I put together, the thing that happens is if you get all of this material on the land, all, the, all these living organisms on the land, you start to suck nitrogen out of the atmosphere. That nitrogen gets fixed, just like you plant your peas in your spring garden so that you get you fix the nitrogen for the, the tomatoes in your, your summer garden. We were the plants were able to fix this nitrogen. That's fixation. Once those plants died or they dropped their leaves, or they didn't really have leaves, but when they dropped their parts, made it into the, the rivers. So you get more of that. Um, that stuff that allows you to harvest energy from the sun and the ocean, so your, your, your cycling becomes more intense. You get more and more of these sort of algal blooms, so you're getting more and more stuff being deposited and buried in the bottom. So the, one of the reasons the Marcellus Shale has such a high amount of carbon, that carbon is the same methane that we're extracting from it, is because this was a period of really dramatic changes in the, the, the botany of the um, of the, both of the ocean and terrestrial systems. And just to recall, people again think it's like the Black Sea, and it was these kinds of huge blooms of algal material that were being sort of blooming, dying, sinking, and they stayed there until now we're fracturing the rock so that that material can make its way back out. So that's the first thing that we want to talk about today. And the other thing, is there a clock in here just so I can? Yeah, I'll be looking at my cell phone. That's my watch. Do you want my watch? I'll be fine. The thing that continued to happen simultaneously with all of the rest of this is that the sea level is rising and falling. So as, as you get later and later into the Devonian, the sea level had risen. And you can see again, I think, I hope I have Pennsylvania. There's Pennsylvania. So that ocean system, which in the middle of the Devonian had been isolated, much like our Black Sea, our modern Black Sea, um, is now connected well with the rest of the, the um, larger oceanic system in the, the, um, the globe at that point. 
So some of these sort of specific and special things that were going on in that proto-Marcellus area sort of ebb out at the end of the Devonian. So the Devonian was a special time, huge changes in botany, huge changes in the, um, the biology, ending up deposited on this deep, semi-closed basin. But by the end, it had been, the sea level had risen, and it was no longer, um, no longer isolated. So that's, that's the material that got rained out, and that's the material that got deposited, that's the material that is, again, being um, extracted, gas is being extracted from today. But if you went down to the bottom of the Black Sea right now, you're not going to get natural gas the way we're getting natural gas out of the Marcellus. A lot more additional process has to occur before you get to um, you know, one of these very rich shale plates. As you continue into the next, uh, through geologic time, you move into things that are called the Mississippian or the Pennsylvanian periods. And for those of you who are familiar with it, the things that are spectacular about these is the production of coal that all of the coal that has been mined out over the last several hundred years in this area was deposited in the Mississippi and the Pennsylvania. I mean, this is one of the prime areas for coal deposition, hence Pennsylvania, through the Carboniferous. So you can see this period, this area that, <coughs> you can't see it, I don't think I have it outlined, but here's Pennsylvania. So again, throughout this Mississippi and Pennsylvania, we're going through these cycles of ocean rising, ocean falling, these floods end up allowing and facilitating the deposition of coal through a very different kind of process. So this is, again, another artist's rendition of what a swamp that became a coal mine looks like. So you had probably something that looks like a, a, a contemporary um, you know, Okie Finoki or Great Dismal Swamp. You just had a lot of trees harvesting a lot of sun energy and they're depositing it right in the water. So that stuff is accumulating. And you're getting thick, 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 almost 100% carbon. Whereas when you had the Marcellus Shale being deposited at the bottom of that deep, deep oceanic environment, you had a lot of sediment coming in from these Appalachian mountains that were gradually wearing down at that point. So, you know, the Marcellus turns off, you rise the ocean level. It's no longer isolated. So you don't get that kind of anoxic. Once you're connected, you can get more mixing. You, you don't get that anoxia. You, you have good communication with more oxygen-rich waters. So your, your sediments become less, less, less carbon-rich. And they're, they're capping what's going to become the Marcellus Shale down here, and just sort of sitting there. But following that, and following these, these next several hundred million years, when you, again, you start to <coughs> drop your ocean level again, so I eroded the mountains a little bit, <coughs> dropped your ocean. What's going to end, end up happening is that you get these swamps and you get this thick layer of coal being deposited amongst other sediments. And I'm showing this as a, as a very, very simple cartoon, and I think what, it's important to go look at these because you know, we think of these coals as these huge, extensive masses, but they're, they're really not quite like that. So what's going on is called the a marine regression or transgression <coughs> um, sequence. So when your sea level is low out here, you're getting sort of a, a, a limestone calcite production out here. And that, of course, is from your coral reefs. You move in. <coughs> this is a, an area of mud and silt. So this is probably the area, the lagoon area, you know, if you have a coral reef and you have your lagoon that's trapping all the, the fine particles, and you have your sand, which is, is your beach dunes. So sand is big enough that it's moved around, the waves move it in, it's get captured in the wind, moves up and down. Then as you start to move your, you know, your sea level up, so you can see in that second stage, you, you've, moved, you've arised your sea level, all of that stuff starts to shift in towards the shoreline. So your calcite starts to be slightly further to the, um, 
right hand side of the schematic, likewise the mud and silt, likewise the sand. So at the end, what you get are these layers of limestone, carbon, layers of shale, mudstone, the kinds of things that are outcropping in your backyards, or, or sandstone here. And this is a, a pretty, um, again, this is still not reality, this is a, a schematic of reality, but if you think about it, if we focus in on some of these and we think about it and sort of what it is going on in an individual sort of length of shoreline. So you can see here, you're out in these shaly areas, and this is what's called the Barrier Island. The Barrier Island is the kind of place that you go if you go to Ocean City, you go to Assateague. These are the kinds of systems, so you have the, the um, sandy beaches moving up and down, moved by the wave action, moved by the wind action. You're getting your, your silt out here, but in the back you have what's called the back bay. And the back bay is really where you had these tremendous um, coal producing forest, I mean, forests growing. So out in here you have this, out here you have this. So as <clears throat> this area that had been the Marcellus Ocean has been buried and sea level is going up, and down, you're getting <clears throat> these thick, continuous deposits of coal. If you know my name, you can call them that, but all up and through this part of Pennsylvania. So and that's very different than what went on with the Marcellus, and that's that's important to remember. The other thing that goes on during this period that's important to consider is that. The con there's a huge continental collision right along here, right between the Mississippi and the Pennsylvania. So this is important because for a number of reasons. Um, so this is late Mississippian. We go to early Pennsylvanian. You see that you've created some very, very large mountains here. So the most recent sort of continental collision that we have on the contemporary Earth's surface is the Himalayan, so this is the Himalayan kind of thing that was going on. Again, here's Pennsylvania. So we had, you woke up in the morning, you rolled out to the huge snow-capped mountains, more or less, probably. <laughs> and so you have, you thrust this up, you increase erosion, so this area, it's still kind of persisting, this sort of Marcellus area, has a lot of sediment lot of sediment. It's not just, you know, <clears throat> the kind of stuff you see off of the coast of the, the Atlantic coast of the United States right now because we're really nubs of what we once were in terms of mountains. This is the kind of stuff you see coming out of the Ganges, some of these large rivers in the Brahmaputra in, in, in India, just huge amounts of water, huge amounts of sediment, and that buried and buried and buried the um, Marcellus Shield. So you have these sediments that have been enriched with carbon, and now they're getting buried, buried, buried. The other thing that happens when you have this kind of collision, I mean it's not it's not something we can feel. It's not something that we're you know, you wake up one morning and oh, the continent collided it today. <laughs> but it does create a lot of lot of um, stress and strain on the rocks. So this is a picture of Marcellus Shale outcropping. So Marcellus Shale outcrops, it actually comes to the surface in some places along the Erie Coast and you know, northern sort of New York parts of the extent of the Marcellus Shale. And the thing you can see about the Marcellus Shale, I think in some parts of Pennsylvania too, is when you walk over it there are these linear features. This is called the what one person at Penn State, Terry Infelder, is called the J1 fracture, and then the J2 fracture. So because of this tremendous stress and strain caused by the um, collision of these two continents, you have this Marcellus shell that's been buried, but it's also been fractured in a very, very regular way. I mean, you can go along there and find things that look like roofing shingles because they are, the, the fracturing is so regular. <clears throat> and so let's just jump ahead several million years and we've got all of 
this, this, this area has been buried, this, this old Marcellus sediment has been buried. It's been shooken a little bit during that continental collision. And just for reference, we're about sitting right here, more or less. So this is a cross-section looking across from central Ohio to central Pennsylvania. So we're right about the middle, a little bit to the, to the east of the middle. So the thing to think about here is that now sitting on top of that old Marcellus formation, you've got about a mile of rock, right? So you know, when it gets humid around here, you can feel the extra rate of that water vapor in the air pressing down on you a little bit. Maybe you can, but it sure seems like it in something like last weekend. Um, you can imagine if that was all rock. So what you have is you have a lot of pressure pushing down on this old sediment. And not only do you have pressure, because you're relatively closer to the center of the Earth, in the center of the Earth, we, see, we think, and it's, how, it's not something we can go look at, but is made up of molten metals. It's a very, very hot thing. It's, it's left over from even the, the formation of, of the planet. I mean, it's, we're, we've got this hot, hot core. So the deeper you go in the, into, the, into the Earth's crust, the hotter it gets. So you've got a lot of temperature and a lot of pressure. And that's important because it really determines what kind of hydrocarbons are going to end up if you have a lot of sediment. So this is a, a, a plot that shows the temperature wherein your, your material is sitting and the pressure um, that's acting on this material. So this here, this sort of olive green area is life. So and once you get it drops below zero degrees Celsius, you tend to start freezing and you don't really last very long. If you get past 100 degrees Celsius, even those things that live in the, the mud pots in Yellowstone start to die because you get steam bursts and you break your cellular membrane. Um, you can live under certain amounts of pressure, but after a while you just start to get crushed. You start to jack that temperature up. You start to increase that temperature ever so slowly. What well, was once just life, just the, the stuff that is sloughed off as a normal process, turns into things that are called, you know, there's various precursors. There's a whole line of stuff that petroleum geochemists can tell you about. But the point is, is you need to get relatively hotter to get to something where you're going to start generating natural gas. Um, you know, 100 years ago, oil, for various reasons, was the hydrogen, the hydrocarbon of choice. So rocks that have been through this period, so you've got a little elevation in your pressure, and you've got some elevation in your temperature. That was what you were looking for, particularly areas where you could get stuff migrating into something you could pull it all out of. But now, since we're more interested in <clears throat> natural gas for any number of reasons, um, we're starting to look for things that have been hotter. So that means you have to have had been buried deeper. And that also means that you're going to get more pressure. So the Marcellus, through Earth history, has been sitting more here. So that's the reason the Marcellus has ended up with gas. So it's still a very, very dense rock. It's still not the kind of thing that you could go and put an um, oil well in and get a gusher out of because it's so tight. I mean, that, it's been pushed together. It was very, very fine sediment to begin with. And so it's very different than what we sort of think of in terms of the classic petrochemical petro um, extraction. One thing I did want to point out is this area right here is where you get what's called wet gas. And wet gas is something you probably might have heard of on the news if you've been following it. It's something that the Utica shale seems to have more wet gas than the Marcellus gas. And all wet gas means is you have a little bit of stuff that's almost oil-like. So when you pull it out, you can condense it and you can sell it. You can crack it or 
put it together and you can sell it <coughs> for slightly more than you can in dry gas. So the Marcellus is a drier gas than the Utica, and so with the changes in commodity prices, you can see a switch in its in development and exploration of the Utica versus the, the um, Marcellus or some of the other various shales throughout the United States. So that, that's just for you guys' benefit if you see that. <coughs> so just to review, so we've got this, this shale that was deposited in this deep ocean that was somewhat isolated from the rest of the um, world ocean system. And it's not a sedimentary sequence. It's been buried by thousands and thousands of feet of sedimentary sequences. And sedimentary sequence is just this process where sea level goes up, you get your, your barrier island, you get your um, corals growing, and your, they end up growing in almost linear fashion when we see them today, millions of years later. And so it's much tighter than this. We don't have a place where you can accumulate oil. There's no coarse grain sand where all of that oil can migrate to, where all of that gas can migrate to. So it's very different. But the other thing is, is that we still have those joints. I showed you those joints that are very, very regular. And those things are actually the reason that we are able to do this hydrofracking so well in the Marcellus. Because if you can put your collection air, your collection system all along, you know, one of these joints, you have all of these side joints bring, that potentially could bring gas into there. So the trick is, is to open those joints up. And that's, and uh, there's a lot of the gas there because of the, the history. And that's why we get to this horizontal fracking. So this hydraulic fracturing is something that's been going on for many, many years. And, but what it has in the past has been a vertical well. So basically you put your well down, you put, I'm not, I've never seen this happen, so this is all kind of hearsay. You put what's called a gun down and you shoot um, water, or you shoot some sort of explosives out, you pump water in almost immediately. That's the hydraulic. The hydraulic part means water pressure. And you force all of those little side joints that we saw open. <coughs> and there are things about it that, you know, the, the controversy surrounding what's in hydraulic fracturing liquid is in order to get those joints to stay open, you have to be able to be pushing sand along with that water out into these immediately after your frack. So you've got lots of things that are like surfactants, and you've got things that are like a silica gel. And you basically, you've got to get that chemistry right so that that water flows at high temperatures and pressures. And so if you hear things about what's in that water, there's still really no systematic reporting requirements about what's in that water. There's voluntary reporting requirements. But the reason that you have that is because you want to be able to force sand into those J veins after you break them open a little bit. So they stay there so the gas can migrate into your collection line. The big thing that has really made this change since you know 2006, about the same time I got here, is that people figure out a way so that you can now drill horizontally. So remember, we have this extensive lateral bed of sediment with these exquisitely spaced veins, I mean fractures. So if you can put this horizontal well in, now whereas you used to have an area like this, you started to draw gas from, you can draw gas from very, very long lengths. So just to give you scale, um, Generally, we're about a mile deep around here, the Marcellus is. And these feeder lines generally go out a mile or two. Well, I've heard up to two, but generally a mile in each direction. So, you know, that this is definitely not the scale because that oil rig is you know, it's a tenth of a mile tall. It's not the case, but so that's about a mile long. It's about a mile deep. Do you want to take questions now or at the end? Uh, I'm almost done, so maybe we'll point to the end. I can always do that. 
Okay, we talked about that. And one of the things to focus on as you think about this and follow this in the news, because this is our safety measure, is how well we're sealing up this hole. Because by drilling this thing deep, a mile deep into our, our the depths of our, our bedrock, there's an opportunity for things to move between formations that really didn't move between formations before. Um, so we have to make sure that those things are very, very tight and they are very, very resilient. So one of the things that probably people have heard about is methane in drinking water wells. And one of the reasons this is so controversial, other than the bottom line of dollars and not what it, and all of that, is that in these areas, you can have natural gas coming from different sources. So if you are taking material from a rock here, you might be getting natural gas that's from just sort of the, the decay of biological material. At the same time, you're getting gas that has been through a, a thermal process that has changed the nature of it. So what ends up happening is sometimes <coughs> you have these very deep wells that are positioned very close to groundwater drinking wells, I mean, domestic wells. Um, for the most part, it's been individual homeowners that have been affected that I've heard of who have started to see things like methane uh, in their water. I mean, if you guys have seen, um, I'm blanking, Gasland, that's the, you know, lighting your, 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 your water on fire. It's from some sort of methane source. And there's ambiguity here because people keep pointing in each direction saying, oh, it's just the <clears throat> normal kind of bacterial gas that you get in any sort of near earth surface decay, and during the fracking, you just swoosh the aquifer so it all starts to collect in wells. Whereas there have been <clears throat> some clear cases where and there's been leaks and some methane does make it up. You know, you're collecting methane all along these feeder lines, and if you don't have a good seal, that methane can come up here, hop out, and move across the sediments into other people's drinking water wells. So there's multiple processes, and there's no, there's some ways that you can start to try to come up with an idea of what's going on, and whether or not it's moving between the wells, or if it's coming from these sort of other pools of natural gas. But right now, we're kind of in this period where, because there isn't good before information, we're left with ambiguous, ambiguous um, responsibility. And so the little, the, when the bull elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. So I mean, that's, that's what's going on in Denmark. The other thing that is coming on is there's a lot of salt that comes out of the Marcellus. And this has been a surprise to people who develop these technologies in other parts of the country. And I just want to show you that part of the reason that this occurs is probably because of this sort of paleo geography, this paleo oceanography. Um, so the hydraulic fracturing is the forcing of water at high pressures down to force that sand and force those cracks open, force sand into those cracks so that you can pull gas out of these systems. The other thing that comes back is water, because you put a lot of water down. I mean, almost a million gallons per thousand feet of well. And I'll just show you some data about what that water looks like. So this is where seawater is. This is a plot of sodium versus chloride. So that's your table salt. It's shown on a log plot. So each time you move between one of these ticks, you're increasing by a factor of 10. The reason we do that is so that we can show things all on the same plot. If we didn't plot it like that, all of these things would look like a small dot over in that corner. But this is all data from either the industry or the government. So this is more or less what you'd call fresh water. It's all of the water. Samples taken by the USGS from the Monongahela or tributaries that I could find back in, I think this was in 2010 when I first made this. 
The green are things from a database of acidic mine drainage waters. So the waters that you would encounter in southwestern Pennsylvania would look something like that. The blue is stuff from the Marcellus Shale Coalition's report on the water quality. So you've got some before waters. These are the things that they actually put sampled before they fracked. And then as you go, actually this develops with time, it becomes saltier and saltier. So the first stuff that comes back in the first day looks like this. It's not seawater yet. It's picking up a lot of salt. But by day 90 out here, you're into things that are several, 10 to 100 times more salty than seawater. And that is going to be a very big solid waste management problem. Because even if you are able to take it out of the water, recycle all that water, and reuse it to frack, you still have a lot of salt. The problem with salt is, anytime a hint of water comes in, it dissolves. Some people want to put it on roads, but this isn't just your halite. This is other things in it that we have to be very careful about, including things like arsenic. And so this is a controversy you guys might have seen. These are the, the residual waste trucks you probably have seen driving through the countryside. And up until about a year ago, we were actually just taking the salt and putting it in Monongahela. And that's one of the reasons we we're having TDS, total dissolved solid um, violations in that dry summer. So May 2011, there is a voluntary cessation of this practice, and it's gotten better. In terms of that, now they, send, they tend to send it to underground injection wells over in Ohio. But you know, I mean, it's, if there's gonna, this is not going to go away. There's capacities on underground injection control. We're either going to make more of them, or people will try something new. And so, if you just to think about the paleo geography, so this is the Barnett Shale. That's where a lot of this stuff was developed. All of these methods were developed in the Barnett in Texas. The Barnett is a um, it's not Mississippi. I'm sorry. It's a um, Silurian Shale. So please ignore this. I just did not change my thing. But so you can see the Devonian Marcellus. This is when the Marcellus was being laid down, isolated. The Barnett, which is about right here, is in a deep spot, but this deep spot is relatively <clears throat> in touch with the rest of the ocean. The Silurian also was a period of not much terrestrial land activity, so it was very different. But the other thing about a closed basin is, closed basins evaporate water and they keep that salt that's coming in in your sort of dissolved chemical load. So that's one of the reasons. This Marcellus is a lot, saltier than, a lot saltier than people expected. When the salt started coming up, they didn't really know what to do, think, do with it, didn't think about what to do with it, so it caused some problems. And just to get in, I'm not going to get into the politics because I don't have time. But, you know, this is a historical society, and to paraphrase Santiana, I mean, there are things that we don't want to repeat. In this region, extractive processes because of ambiguities and responsibility of less than messes that people clean up. You know, a lot of the AMD in this area has actually um, been cleaned up by organizations like Trout Unlimited, these non-governmental organizations. These are hard things to solve, and we're lucky that we have people that work that hard to do that. But it also <coughs> subjects local people to risks that are much higher than you might get if you're living somewhere else and using the gas. So this is a picture of a mine rescue in 1918. So we have to be very mindful of this. We have to be very careful about the way in which we're using this, this richness underneath us. Um, because what's really playing out isn't this geologic drama. The geologic drama is it's, it's a painting. We've got a couple of points. We've painted them together. We can tell you this great story. But how we're utilizing this is really a human story and I mean it's not probably history it's not I mean, five years old that's very contemporary history if you will um, but I think that there's a lot of history in this area that we can use to think about ways to better utilize it and
Do there's some time left. first instance of the shale, they said, oh, this is a different rock. Let's name it after the town we're nearby. And if I could have another question. Oh, what has been uh, the main uh, problem we have had so far in trying to get the gas out? Using the water in the wrong way or not knowing what to do with it? I think that the, the biggest problem is, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that if we're done differently, I think would not be as much of a problem. I think the secrecy that surrounds what's actually in these waters before they put it down, if they weren't so secretive, I don't think there would be as much of a tenseness, because I think that a lot of the stuff they put in there is not particularly worrisome. I'm not sure, because I can't see it, and that's that's the niggling question. I think that that could be solved. Um, I think that the problem that people have not thought about is what's going to happen when we get all of this salt out. So we actually have a reverse osmosis desalinization plant on the Monongahela River. It's the kind of thing that you would normally have in some place like Saudi Arabia where you have a lot of money and not much water. And that's good because the water that comes out of that is going to be relatively salt free, but then you have, I mean, if you project out the number of wells, the number of, the amount of salt, you know, you can fill up Heinz Field with salt. And then what do you do with it? You can't put it in a, a landfill because the landfill is not going to be watertight, so that salt will actually make it back into the water somehow. So we don't have a good place to put that salt. We're relying on these Ohio underground injection controls, but then if you have to truck all of this water all that far, then these arguments about how much less carbon and how much cleaner we're going to be if using diesel trucks, you know, you start to, it's not as sweet as it is on the, in the simple, simple story. So I, I would say the thing that I worry most about is people are not thinking about where to put that salt. You had the next question. Um, so you talked about the stress fractures that came from the, um, the collision of continents. Um, is the drilling like parallel to those? Well, that's the object. If you can get it parallel, you have a good hole. So if you're good, if you have a good geologic team and good engineering team, and you get it right along one of those. That's one of the wells that's going to be making you lots of money. So, so if this is the well. Um, do you always drill in a particular like compass direction, or, or are they drill are they drilling out like a star or something? It's like a, it's like a star. So from anything from just the four cardinal directions to you know six, I think six is about the average. So well, another thing that they developed is these huge well pads that basically are on feet. So you drill one well, you just stand it up, walk it a little bit, and then you drill another well out in the next direction. So you're able to sort of minimize the um, the impact on the land surface. You don't have to clear as many trees, and you can get a much larger area. So, well, you, places like Texas, where some of these oil fields, you're, you're sort of following your township range section roads. You just have like every mile, you have a little pad. In the Marcellus, you're going to be able to have sort of a smaller footprint. It's one of the things that they tout. But you're right. They they take one, and then put it out in six directions, and some are better than others. Because I, I heard it, if I could follow on a little bit, it's related. Um, I heard someone say that you go out and, like, you might send a few this way, and you might send a few that way, but I never heard anyone say that you send them sort of radially out. If you would send them three in the same direction, that's kind of defeating the purpose, because what you want to be doing is using that natural plumbing. So if you're sending three out, you're being redundant. And, Horizontal drilling costs a lot of money. It's not like it's 
not vertical drowning, it's not water well drowning. And so it's you have a lot of specialized equipment, you want to minimize that. So if you're if you're washing your bottom line, you're gonna take the minimum number of um, lines out that you possibly can. So if you have three out, I don't I've never heard that. I think that four to six is the number I've heard before. Yeah. As I understand it, for each horizontal well there is a vertical well. Yes. So one vertical well doesn't oh, go out. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. no, there's six vertical holes right. that go out. There's it's not one hole with six different directions. I'm sorry, I misunderstood right. your question. Hey Dan. How much uh, how much gas is does a typical well produce? Is there any time to <laughs> no one's going to tell us that. I mean, that's, 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 that's like, they've got their cards right. Here. I'm thinking about it in terms of the ethane cracker that they're trying to build in Europe. I don't know what this production is. I could, I could try to find some of them if you want to email me. But I think that they're going to start drilling a lot more wells in the area to feed that. There is a, web, <coughs> there is a website called FRAC, F A R C focus.org. And it's a very, very informative website. So, a lot of stuff about my solar shell. From a geological perspective, if you have a, a very widespread, large region with a lot of fracking, does that increase the risk? Can you that? She's asking, she says, if you have a lot of. A large region with a lot of different wells, does that increase some of the risks of things like earthquakes? And the, the, the earthquakes seem to be a function of this underground injection control. So underground injection control is basically you find an area oftentimes under a salt dome so that it's, <coughs> it's never going to make its way to the earth. It's never going to make its way to the earth. I mean, you want to be very, very, very sure that it doesn't have a chance to migrate out. <clears throat> then you inject everything that you don't want to touch for you know, foreseeable future <coughs> underneath that. But the thing that happens is, and, and again, it could be in the Fayette, you're right, the, the Fayette was a, a shale formation in Arkansas where they tend to have a lot of seismic activity, a lot of earthquakes following this fracking. So underground injection control that causes some of the earthquakes. The other stuff, I don't know enough about that to be able to answer the question about the number versus spatial extent. Um, the, well, the heart, the hardness of the shale deposit relative to the other deposits above and below it, are, are we destroying one of the harder layers, or is it, is it not really? I think what is happening if there is movement is you're putting enough water in here that you're actually starting to float the rocks a little bit. You float the rocks a little bit, the contact between whatever that was holding them. So if there's a little bit of space down here, all of a sudden it can shift down and that's what becomes the earth. So maybe if you have a lot of fracking in one area, you could create a heightened risk. But I, I you know, that. That's almost like one of those paintings of the Devonian Earth surface. And I think that's a guess. But you talk, you talk about the sediments. You never talked about uh, crinoids or, or brachiopods and things. Where, where do they fit into it? I think they fit into the Pennsylvania. They do. Yeah, and I, I just they're cold. So the pens, the, the crinoids and the brachiopods are going to be. And I was just concentrating on the coal versus you find most of your fossils in carboniferous, or in calcareous rocks. So they're going to be hanging out out here. That are they're going to be more um, in your reefy area, whereas the coal was probably. I mean, since this is moving back and forth like a tractor, they're all juxtaposed with each other. But I'm not. I'm not I, I was trying to concentrate. I was trying to. What I was trying to do is draw a contrast between the coal fields and the Marcellus. So I, I didn't go into it completely. You know, I was up here for 50 minutes. <laughs> I can't get everything. I was in the impression that they were drilling down over two miles, not one mile. And the youth, I think, probably are. I mean, it, it's really a question of where you are and how deep it is. It's not, 
a mile is a rule of thumb, but you can be half a mile, you can be two miles. You're exactly right. Do, and, right now, locally, locally meaning that sure. 100 miles around, is it two miles down? I, I would have to look at the data. I mean, that's something you could get off the DEP's website. Each of, them, each of the wells has a depth associated with it. You could average it, but I haven't done that. Did you finish that thought about injecting under salt domes? Yeah, I mean, so at some point you're going to fill up that area under the salt dome and you have to get to a different underground injection control. But again, that's, you're injecting usually in water. So again, I don't have a picture of the salt dome, but anything below that is going to float a little bit. So if there's any sort of slope, something that it could float down, that's all, adding all of that water floats it and allows movement of rock, which causes earthquakes. Which is, I think, part of the reason that Youngstown has some big underground injection control that way. Are there other shale deposits lower, like maybe in Benny Mile Floor, or was it a result of such unique like, processes that it's just a single? No, there, so there's places in Beaver County I've heard. I don't have a picture of it, but I want to get to this one. That, the Utica's below that. Right, right so you, you can, there's some permits that have been written so that you can take the Utica, the Marcellus, and there's two other minor black shales. So they're actually going to have four different levels on these permits that they're going to frack. But so these are, these are the ones that we know about right now. Some of them are very deep, some of them are, are less deep. I think the, the Barnett is not as deep as the Marcellus. But that's just my guess. Um, but you know, so in some cases you do have multiple layers that you could from one drill pad and see. Um, we're I don't know. Does the um, Marcellus shell fracking have any dangers of um, sub subsidence the way coal mines do? So, probably not, because, but, uh, we don't know. But you're, what you're doing is you're putting a pipe that's probably a foot in diameter, a mile long. Whereas, you know, things like long wall mining, you're taking everything out over an extended area. Whereas these are, there's long things. And because you're removing that, there's a place for the stuff to go, so things subside. But in the Marcellus, I'm not sure where stuff would go. So I I don't know, but I would tend to think that that's less of a risk than somewhat like the, the waste management issue that's moving. You use that word ambiguity, which, which I, you were in reference to ambiguity in terms of not knowing anything? Being able to say that there's a reasonable doubt mm -hmm. that it's not my that it's, there's a reasonable doubt that I did it. So yeah. if you can prove the reasonable, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. there's, you have the standard of proof in some of our systems, you know, is very different than the standard of proof, you know, where I'm from, we are always arguing. It's always a conversation about what we think is going on, and we come to a pretty, you know, we, we start to think that we can understand what has happened by just looking at the, the, the results. So we invert things. But inversion, getting a jury to, if you're not dealing with things like inversion every day, or if you don't have something that says it was clean, crystal clean, and then you know it's tarry and black, it's, it's a harder sell. So I mean, saying, well, it's probably this, or there's a you know, 95% confidence interval. But, even my eyes glaze over when you start talking about that. Is there someone we can trust? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. of course. I'm I mean, there's scared. no. Yeah, water well, is this. Yeah. Especially salt. Can you imagine? Yeah, I mean, I think that. I, I think that. There needs to be more supervision. I think that some of the. Things that have been exempted, for, for example, some of this, a lot of this stuff is exempted from Safe Drinking Water Act regulations. 
you know, I worked in groundwater protection for a couple of years, and I, I, I teach groundwater, and the, the best way to keep, I mean, the best, most cost-effective way to have clean water is to not mess it up in the first place. So, I mean, there's, and resource extraction is notorious for this, that you have this boom, and then when you, you get a bus cycle, there's no one, you know, all of the ghost towns in Nevada can tell you the same thing. I mean, it's, I think there are people you can trust, but I can't tell you. I mean, that's, that's got to be, that's a gut call, and you probably want to check. Okay. Thanks for all your information. I'm overwhelmed, but I'm glad you just <laughs> It's a lot of thought, but it's very expensive. You have all this salt, you don't know what to do with it. Well, we did dig out in, the, in Nevada, you know, a huge area where we can store radioactive waste, and that's not going to happen. Throw all the salt in there. Yeah, I mean, it just, you have to drill new wells to make it out. Yeah, that's what I mean. No, you put it on a train. Better than radioactive waste. You put it on a train. Thank you very much. You can find me. I have my email is email at pit If you have any further questions, don't forget our walking tour. Please sign up. Don't forget to be here one week earlier next month to hear Freddie Foo.